الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن شاء الله today we will continue with our our fourth lecture in our series on الحسد and إن شاء الله in today's lecture we want to start by continuing with our discussion from last time. And last time we spoke about the different levels of al-hasad and how sometimes when al-hasad enters into the heart of the person, sometimes then the person, for example, will do what he can and when he recognizes that somebody else has a bounty that he is envious of, sometimes he will do what he, what he can to maybe remove that bounty from the other person without necessarily destroying the bounty. In another case, he may try to remove that bounty from the other person and try to get it for himself. And in the third case, he may try to remove that bounty from the other person and just destroy the bounty in itself. And as I said, this is probably as a reflection of a disease. This is probably the worst aspect of, of al-hasad, where the bounty itself, the person is so upset and so miserable that he just wants to see that bounty destroyed even if it doesn't go to anyone else, even if nobody else can benefit from it. So he hates the person who has the bounty and he hates the bounty itself. He just wants to see that bounty destroyed. But we left off with the important question of that obviously al-hasid, the feelings of al-hasid could enter into anybody's heart and anybody's mind. So we left off with the important question of if it is in somebody's mind because even thoughts like shirk and kufr can enter into somebody's mind so if it is in this if it does enter into somebody's mind and let's say he does not take any steps he does not act upon that feeling is this also a sin or what what is his situation in such a case so al hassan al basri one time said cover or conceal al hasad in your heart for it will not harm you as long as it, is, as it does not go upon your tongue or you act upon it by your hands. And Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad also said the cure for al-hasad is its concealment. Here the point that they're both making, all the more explicitly by al-Hasan al-Basri, is that if you feel it in your heart then conceal it, keep it there, don't let it don't let it affect your speech, don't let it affect your your actions. And then inshallah it will not cause any harm to you. Once obviously once it moves on to actions that you do, whether it's something you say or, or uh, something you do obviously, then this comes to a different level and this will be without any question a sin. Now one of the basis for this view is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ recorded by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَجَاوَزَ عَنْ أُمَّتِي مَا حَدَّثَتْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهَا مَا لَمْ تَعْمَلْ أَوْ تَتَكَلَّمْ Verily Allah has overlooked for my ummah what their souls think about as long as they do not act on it or speak about it. So if and al muhasabi now there's of course certain interpretations or certain understandings of this hadith that we have to be aware of. But al muhasabi speaking about what Al-Hasan al-Basri said, concealing al hasad in, in your heart. al muhasabi said that what Al-Hasan said is correct in the sense that when someone conceals al hasad in his heart, this means that he dislikes this feeling of al hasad So once he dislikes this feeling of al hasad and tries to conceal it, then yes, definitely, there's no question, inshallah, that uh, he will not be blamed with it. Okay, so, it is possible, obviously, it is possible that something enters somebody's heart, and inshallah, as long as that person realizes the wrong in it and does not act upon it and does not say anything based on that feeling, then inshallah, this fleeting uh, feeling and this fleeting emotion that enters in his heart, inshallah, the person will not be sinful for it. And this, obviously, al hasad this could happen to anyone. If, if, as we said, if feelings or if, uh, thoughts of kufr and shirk 
can happen to anyone. Then obviously, the feelings of al hasad can enter someone's heart. But if it is just a fleeting emotion, something that just passes and the person conceals it, does not act upon it, does not speak based on that feeling, inshallah, then he is not held responsible for that. And in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not be sinful. However, there are different levels with respect even to just this feeling in the heart. Because if this feeling enters the heart and the person does not object to it and does not conceal it as al Hassan said or does not have any feeling about it, then it could be a sin. In fact, most scholars will say, the majority of the scholars will say that it is a sin. That if, for example, someone has the feelings of al Hassan in his heart and he has no objection to it, he, he likes this feeling of hating someone for what he has, and so he allows that feeling to be in his heart and lets it, maybe not necessarily lets it grow, but he has no objection to it and he kind of enjoys this feeling that he has towards somebody else. Then in this matter, this is now a different case. Okay, this is not the one who feels that it's wrong and so therefore he tries to conceal it, tries to cover it up and make sure that it doesn't have any effect on, on his actions or his statements and so forth. This person Actually, you can say maybe he's kind of enjoying it or he has no problem with the fact that he's feeling this hazard towards somebody else and towards some bounty that somebody else has received. So in this case, even if this person does not act upon it and even if this person does not speak any words based on that feeling of hazard, but he has no objection to it, then according to the majority of the scholars, Although there is some difference of opinion on this case, but it seems that they have the strongest uh, uh, evidence on their side that yes, this is also a sin. This is in itself, this is a sin. And Ibn Rajab said that if it is not a sin, even if it is not a sin, the person who allows this to occur to himself, he says, Ibn Rajab says that it's very rare that this person then will be safe from committing any sin and committing any action towards his brother based on this envy. So therefore, in the end, he says it will become a definitive sin without any question. So either you're in a situation where it's, there's no question that it's a sin, or obviously, obviously, if you don't do anything about it, it may easily lead you to do some act or speak something which will make it then without any question a sin. And Muhasabi points out that this is, if it, if you have that feeling in your heart, in your heart, towards someone, even if you don't act upon it, but you enjoying that feeling and you have no problem with that feeling in your heart, Al Muhasabi said this is a sin, uh, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason that he's making this point, so as long as you do not act upon or do something, do, do any action with respect to it, and this is a sin between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what he means by that or the point that he's making is that therefore the repentance is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you commit a sin towards somebody else, if you do something wrong towards somebody else, some action of doing some wrong, then as all of you are familiar with, I believe the, the acts of repentance, then if you do some something wrong towards somebody else, then you should seek his forgiveness if possible. And again, this has also its principles related to it. We don't need to get into that right now. But if possible, you should seek that person's forgiveness in this life uh, before you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. But in this case, Al-Muhasabi is saying that this is actually a sin. It is a sin, uh, you could say, towards one's brother. But in reality, it is just between the person, the individual, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, the person just repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he doesn't have to actually go out and tell the person that I had this feeling towards you and please forgive me and so forth because he did not act upon it he did not take any steps so therefore his repentance is just between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the big issue as we said all sorts of emotions all sorts of thoughts can come to a person's mind and to his heart and the big issue is what does the person do with respect to those feelings and those emotions that may come fleetingly to his heart. If he allows them to build and grow, then obviously he's committing a sin. But if he recognizes, if he recognizes the evil that is in his heart, 
and tries to take steps to conceal it, then inshallah he will not be sinful. So we have, we have for example, those people who it comes fleetingly to them and they are able to conceal it. It is just something like passing, like uh, feelings of shirk and kufr. Inshallah they will not be held responsible for that. We have, on the other end, we have those people who, even if they don't act upon it, they like the feeling, they're not upset with the feeling, and so therefore, even though they have this disease in their heart, they are, according to the majority of the scholars, they are committing a sin, and as Imam Rajib said, then it will also be very easy for them afterwards to actually act upon that, and therefore, we could say, compound their sin by doing something openly which is without any question of sin. Now there are those people who do get this feeling of envy in their hearts and they recognize the fact that it is envy but unfortunately they cannot control it okay, again they don't act upon it they don't speak they don't say any for example they don't backbite the one that they are envious of to try to harm the, the person or the bounty that he has received so they recognize the wrong in their heart but they cannot control it in other words they, they they try to remove that feeling from their hearts, but they cannot remove it. So they recognize the wrong, they're not accepting it, but at the same time they're not strong enough to remove that feeling in their heart. So the, the feeling is staying with them. So these people, inshallah, inshallah, these people are not sinful for that thing which they cannot control. They are recognizing it as wrong. Now of course everyone everyone has to be honest with themselves okay. everyone has to be truly honest with themselves and see whether or not they're actually acting upon the hasid whether or not they are speaking words that are based on the hasid whether or not they are enjoying the hasid or whether or not they are truly trying to fight the hasid in their hearts okay. and this is one of the most difficult things that human beings have to face that they have to be honest with respect to themselves human beings m many times make excuses for themselves cover up their own faults and say oh no there's nothing wrong with it it's not that level of al hasad they even act upon the hasad and still say to themselves oh no it's not affecting me I don't have hasad and so forth so when we talk about these different states a very important aspect is that the individuals have to be honest with themselves now you think that this would go without saying because you know for someone to be dishonest to himself who is he hurting? <laughs> you know he's only hurting himself but that is the nature of these diseases of the heart like someone who smokes for example the main person he's of course we know about secondhand smoke and so forth <laughs> nowadays but the main person that he's hurting is himself so it is, it does happen that people hurt themselves. Even though we consider human beings rational human beings and all, <laughs> all of economics is built on the assumption that human beings are rational human beings, human beings do do things that hurt themselves and they are not honest with themselves. Those people, inshallah, who purify their souls, inshallah, they are the people who can be honest with themselves, truly self-critical, without going to either extreme making excuses for themselves or overly criticizing themselves to such a state that they're to such an extent that they're in a state of despair and they cannot do anything and cannot even act for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when one is honest with himself and finds that he has this feeling of an hasid and he knows it's wrong and he's trying to control but he's not able to control it then inshallah in a state like that the person is not held sinful and not held responsible for something that is beyond his means he has tried his best but it is something beyond his means and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden the soul or hold the soul responsible for something that is beyond his means that the real evil of al hasad comes about when the person acts upon his hasad not when is not when is just in the heart. Now what Ibn Al is saying should not be especially if you're familiar with Ibn Al other writings, should not be taken to contradict what we said earlier. If the person is pleased with what is in his heart, he is still sinful. If it is al hasad in his heart and he knows it's a sin, but he is pleased with it, he is still sinful. But what Ibn Al is referring to here 
is that in general, if al hasad cannot be controlled by a person, then the sin of al hasad is basically only when it is acted upon. And that is why Ibn al Qayyim says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tell us to seek refuge of the envious one, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to seek refuge of the envious one when he is being envious. Right? From the verse in the Quran, وَمَنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حسد. From the evil of the envious one when he envies. Yeah, because envy can exist in the heart as we said envy can enter into anybody's heart but as long as the person is not speaking upon it or acting upon it then he is not necessarily harming anybody else so we seek refuge not from the envy in other people's heart but from the envy when it is being acted upon when the person is acting upon the envy that is in his heart now another group of people we could say recognize this hasad in their heart they see that they have this feeling of al hasad in their heart and they do their best to remove this hasad from themselves now what this last group of people do and is described by many of the ulama who uh, discuss this concept of al hasad and what distinguishes this group of people and what sets them apart as one of the best groups of people is that from, because of that feeling of al-hasad they try to counter that feeling of al-hasad by turning towards that people, that person that they envied and treat them in the best possible fashion so now we're talking about a situation where al-hasad has entered the heart the person has not acted upon it has not spoken based on it but because he knows that he has had that feeling in his heart to completely counter that feeling in his heart and to make sure that there's no negative ramifications that have come from that feeling in the heart they make sure that they deal with that person for whom they had envy in the best possible way they will make dua for that person imagine that and see how, what a great step this is you feel hassle towards someone you want to make sure that this hasad is not a sin you try to control it in your heart one of the best things that you can do inshallah to really make sure that there's no sin upon you because of this feeling of the hasad if you really want to make sure then you deal with that person for whom you felt this hasad for you deal with him in a special way you make sure to be nice to him and you make dua for him because this is the most if you want to really do an act which, which is sincere between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the other person has no idea that you felt this hasad towards him and so now you're doing an act which is just between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this hasad has entered in your heart you do this act purely between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you sincerely make dua for the other person so this is one of the best steps that you can take this will inshallah make sure or guarantee that any feeling of al-hasad that you might have had in your heart inshallah is going to be removed by these by this dua that you make for the other person and in addition to that you speak well of the other person you speak well of the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that other person and you make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to bless him and blesses him in particular in particular for that bounty or those bounties for which you had hasad this some other writers said this category of people these are among the people of the highest level of faith and they fulfill the requirement of iman that they love for their brothers what they love for themselves so in sum we can say that the feeling of a hasad can enter anybody's heart it doesn't matter how pious you might be because as we said even shirk and kufr some emotions some feelings of shirk and kufr some ideas some thoughts a shaitan can put those into anybody's hearts and mind okay so the question is not simply uh, that this existed this came into your heart but the question now is what do you do with it and the most important aspect of course and the most important approach to it is that you recognize that this is a great disease you have to recognize that this is a great disease and so therefore you have to work to remove it from your hearts 
And this is, this is of course, jihad. This is one of the aspects of jihad. To struggle, to strive, to work, to purify your soul, to sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So when this feeling enters into your heart, the most important thing that you have to do is recognize that it is a great disease. And so therefore, to try to do your best to remove it from your heart, make this type of jihad. One of the ways by which you will recognize what a dangerous and harmful disease this is, is by looking at some of the examples of al-hasad and the ramifications of al-hasad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Qur'an and in the hadith of the Prophet The first example that we can take and which many ulama have pointed to is the example of a shaitan Satan, the devil the majority of the ulama are in agreement that two eternal feelings we can say in the shaitan led him to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and led him to become the most accursed and most evil creature in existence and these are the two diseases of al-hasad and kibr al-hasad envy and kibr arrogance and pride what we see from the Quran for example is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Adam alayhi salam by giving him many virtues by giving him knowledge for example by giving him the honor of being prostrated to by all of the creation or by the, uh, the angels we should say at that time and those in the company of the angels were ordered to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam and the shaitan refused to prostrate to Adam and we see from the shaitan's response that his response shows that he's feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Adam something giving Adam a bounty that shaitan himself feels he's more deserving of so he is envious of this bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Adam alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, قَالَ مَا مَنَعَكَ أَلَّا تَسْجُدَا إِذْ أَمَرْتُكَ قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ خَلَقْتُنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتُهُ مِنْ طِينٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the situation in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he said to a shaitan, what has prevented you from prostrating when I've ordered you to do so? And a shaitan replies, the reason why he didn't prostrate, I am better than him. You have created me from fire and you have created him from clay. So in other words, as we said, he thinks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Adam alayhi salam a bounty that he's more deserving of or that he thinks he's better than Adam alayhi salam so he is envious of this bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Adam alayhi salam and because of this envy because of this disease in his heart he has refused to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a result of his refusal to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though even though he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true right there's no question of whether or not the shaitan knows whether la ilaha illallah is true or not he knows who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is but out of these diseases in his heart he refused to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so therefore he became the greatest of all of the evil creatures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ever created we see from the early existence of mankind we can see, we can see how this disease of al-hasad can penetrate into the hearts of human beings and can even destroy some of the closest bonds that we know of can even pit brother against brother Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a story in the Quran surah al-Ma'idah tells us about the two sons of Adam alayhi salam Cain and Abel the story is well known they both were to give a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the sacrifice of one of them due to his sincerity due to his feeling of trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected 
the sacrifice of the other person, of the other brother. So this led Cain, the one whose uh, sacrifice was rejected, this led him to be completely envious and resentful of what his brother did. So here the two of them are very close, right? They are brothers and they are giving a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from one and rejects it from the other. And what does this lead him to do? The one whose sacrifice was rejected. This leads him actually to kill his brother. So his soul is so filled with this, uh, with this anger and with this envy and this resentment towards his brother that his soul tells him that this is a good thing as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَطَوَّعَتْ لَهُ نَفْسُهُ قَتْلَ أَخِيهِ فَقَتَلَهُ فَأَصْبَهَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ So the soul of the other encouraged him and made fair seeming to him the murder of his brother this disease in his heart the spinning of al-hasad told him that this is a good thing to do basically you can say made it to him to be something good and accepted for him that he should kill his brother and so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so he murdered him and became one of the losers it's bad enough that his <laughs> sacrifice wasn't accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but due to the envy that he felt towards his brother he ended up killing his brother and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and this made him one of the losers so and in implication of this as all the Mufassirin say that this was an act that was the result of envy of Hasid as Ibn Kathir and others said but from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wording here for asbaha min al khasirin and he became one of the losers see his sacrifice was not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but there's room now he can maybe make another sacrifice he can correct himself he can change his ways but he allowed this Hasid to lead him to such a sin to such a uh, state of mind and a state of life that led him to kill his brother so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then فَأَصْبَحَ مِنْ الْخَسْرِ then because of this hasad, because of this disease and what this disease led to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as then becoming one of the losers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran also tells us of the story of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam that they were envious of the love that their father had for Yusuf and for his younger brother so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this story in the Quran and uh, in a whole surah of course the story of uh, Yusuf but this part of it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِذْ قَالُوا لَيُوسُفُ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِينَ مِنَّا وَنَحْنُ أُسْبَةٌ إِنَّا أَبَانَ لَفِي ظُلَالٍ مُبِينٍ اقتلوا يوسف so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says tells us in the Quran that the brothers of Yusuf said that truly Yusuf and his brother are dearer to our father than we are while we are a strong group certainly our father is in plain error so then the first suggestion they said they said kill Yusuf اقتلوا يوسف kill Yusuf or cast him out to some other land so that the favor of our father may be given to you alone and after that you will be righteous folks so first they say the first they said either kill him or throw him out to another land and what is the goal what is the purpose so then the love of your father will be just for you the other brothers so this is another obvious case of, of envy they were envious of the feeling that their father had towards their brother Yusuf and of course that feeling uh, that uh, their father had towards uh, their brother Yusuf was because of the virtues of Yusuf but instead of seeing that they all they could see was that, that their father loved their brother Yusuf and so therefore they could not stand to see that greater love for Yusuf and, and the result is they plotted to actually kill Yusuf or to throw him off to some other land thinking therefore they destroy this bounty that the uh, that their father had this beloved son of their father thinking therefore that that will make it right and then their, that then their father would love them so here's another act another crime 
Here they didn't actually kill Yusuf, like the, the son of Adam killed his brother. But they didn't mind, actually, if they did kill him or not. They put him out and put him in a well, whether he'd be killed or not. This really wasn't of any concern to them. So here we can see how this feeling of al-hasad, the sin in the heart, once people speak about diseases in the heart, we see immediately how these diseases are actually very dangerous and they can lead to crimes, heinous crimes, crimes that will be disastrous for the individual in both this life and the hereafter. And by the way, this don't think you know that these are like stories of the Quran or stories of old and, and these kind of things don't happen anymore. But the idea of envy leading to such spite and, and resentment that it actually leads to murder, this is something that still continues today. Uh, again, Helmut uh, Schork in his, in his book on, uh, on, his en on envy gives many examples. He has a chapter actually in that work called uh, Crimes of Envy. He gives many examples of how envy can even lead to murder. The first section is about murder that is a result of envy where people kill somebody else and then when they're asked, you know, why did you actually kill them? What was really the uh, driving force behind you? They finally admit that they were envious of the other person. Like, for example, somebody drove his, his car into another person just because he was, he was envious of uh, his basketball skills and, and the fact that he was a handsome person, so he was handsome and had basketball skills. In another case, uh, a woman killed her roommate for the same kind of reason that she, uh, her college roommate for the same kind of reason that she was envious of her beauty and envious of the fact that she was prettier than her. Actually, there's one uh, story that uh, he gives, and again, sometimes it's difficult to recognize what is envy, what isn't envy, and so forth. But if this if this story is a an example of of envy, then it shows us how dangerous and how distorted we could say how distorted it makes the human being and the human human mind. Again, as I said, if this is truly a case of uh, has it, it is an interesting story and should make us all reflect upon how how sick really al Hasid can make someone feel. And this story goes back to World War II. There was a boat uh, which was torpedoed in the Indian Ocean. And one of the one of the persons who survived this attack, his name was Walter Gibson, he wrote a book about it called uh, The Boat. So after the torpedo, there was 135 uh, survivors who were on the rafts, who were trying to, of course, uh, live on the ocean and, and survive, so until they would be, until they would be rescued. And he said that uh, among uh, he, there's many interesting points in, in in what he said, but he said one of the things that occurred is that when when they were on these rafts trying to survive, and they were out there for many days, sooner or later some of the people would get to the point that they felt that they could no longer live. They could no longer, they felt that they could no longer put up with, with what they're facing. In other words, they felt that death would be easier than what they are facing, the, the lack of food and the, the heat and everything. So when they would get to that point that they felt that they could no longer survive, they would just simply uh, jump into the ocean. They would jump off the raft and jump into the ocean. And so Walter Gibson describes, though, what happened and he wrote that there was a strange feature of every suicide these people who were at the final point of exasperation they could no longer put up with their situation and they would jump off the raft to kill themselves he said there was a strange feature of every suicide as people decided to jump overboard they, they seemed to resent the fact that others were being left with a chance of safety they would try to seize the rations and fling them overboard. They would try to make their last action in the boat, the pulling of the bung which would let in the water. Their madness always seemed to take the form that they must not go alone, but instead take everyone with them. So if this is truly a case of uh, envy, that they are upset that these that they are giving up and they cannot survive and but these other people are going to continue in the raft and they might survive so therefore they're trying their best to take the others with them 
Okay, now, not, now they think about this. Now they are killing themselves. They are committing suicide. There's nothing, you know. There's nothing they're going to gain from the others living or dying or whatever. Or, or you know, if they could live, if the others live for a hundred years, they they are at the stage of taking their lives. And yet they resent the fact that other people are still going to continue and have the chance to survive. So they try to take the rations. They try to let water into the raft and so forth just to make sure that these others cannot survive. And as I said, if this is really Hasid, if this is, uh, and that's the, basically, that's the way he described it, this is how Walter Gibson, one of the survivors, how he described it. If this is really Hasid, this shows us how, how sick this disease can make someone. I mean, there's no purpose, no benefit whatsoever that can, that could come to these people in any way by the action that they're taking. They are taking themselves to their death but they cannot stand the fact that the others are going to be able possibly to survive and so therefore they try to take them uh, take them with them. There's a number of lessons that we can get from these examples, from the Quranic examples in, in particular. First of all, we see that Al-Hasid is a characteristic of the greatest evil creation that there is. We see that Al-Hasid is a characteristic of a shaitan. This fact in itself, I, I would hope, would lead many people, many Muslims, or any believer, to try to free himself from this disease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطْبَيْتَ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُّبِينٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to follow in the footsteps of a shaitan. He is to, to you an avowed or a clear enemy. Not to follow in his footsteps and obviously not to emulate and not to become like this shaitan. So this is, when we have the feeling of al-hasad, when we find this disease within our hearts, we should think to ourselves that who are we behaving like? Are we behaving like the believers? Are we behaving like the prophets? Or are we actually behaving like a shaitan? And obviously the answer is, is clear. So therefore, whenever we have this feeling in our heart, we should do our best to remove it. If for no other reason <laughs> than to free ourselves to be to free ourselves from being like a shaitan, we see also from these examples is that the power of a hasid, the ramifications of a hasid, what it can lead to in actual deeds, is something very great and can be something horrendous. As we see in these examples in the Quran, the two sons of Adam and the, and the sons of Yaqub the brothers of Yusuf, we see that it can break through perhaps the greatest bond that human beings have, the blood relationship, the family. And Hasid can destroy even the family. If it can destroy the family, obviously it can also probably destroy the relationship between the believers as well. So this means that this is, you know, a very dangerous disease, a very harmful disease. No one should ever, ever find this within himself and be lackadaisical and think that, oh, it's not a big deal and so forth. Especially if he finds himself speaking or acting upon it. Because he doesn't know, he can never know at the beginning what is going to be the final step that he may do based on this hasad. As we said, they were willing to, the brothers of Yusuf were willing to kill him. They didn't mind if he died or not. The son of Adam killed his brother. And we still find examples of people committing murder uh, because of al-hasad. So it is never, it is never something to be taken lightly. It can have a strong effect, as I said. It can even break some of the strongest bonds that human beings know. And in fact, this is another closely related point that we should see in these examples, and that is that the hasad very often, if not the vast majority of the case, the hasad occurs among those people who are most similar to each other. You know, either like blood relations, like what we just said, brothers. Okay. Brothers, they always talk about sibling, sibling rivalry. Okay. They are very close to one another and they are, it is natural maybe to compete with one another or to judge one another uh, against each other. So this al-hasad, as I said, this is something that usually occurs between people who are close. Either close in age, 
person, uh, either like we, we said, brothers and sisters, sibling relationship, uh, close in status, these kind of things. So, and what this means also is that if it can happen between brothers and sisters, it also can happen among close friends. So, when you think of al-hasad, when you think about people whom you should be willing to harm the least, those people who you really don't want to harm, those people who are closest to you, these are the people whom you, whom you may end up harming the most because of your hasad. So this, uh, this is another point that if you were to think about it, this should keep you from allowing this disease to be in your heart. Because it may end up harming the people who are closest to you and who actually you should have the best relationship with, not going out and trying to harm them. So in general, this feeling of al-hasad is, as I said, it is with respect to those people who there is some similarity between you and them, some kind of level of competition, we can say, that there is some uh, reasonable level. In other words, as one author wrote nowadays, a non-Muslim author, he said, for example, to be envious of someone like Walter, Walter Payton doesn't make much sense for the most, most people because in general we don't have his skills, we don't have his ability, so therefore there's no real competition between him and us. We don't feel this feeling of competition between him and us, so we don't feel hasad towards someone like that. Yes, we may still, as is commonly the case, we may still feel that someone maybe is getting too blessed and, and doesn't deserve and so forth, and, and even though we have no relationship with them, we, they may st we may still feel hasad towards them and wish that their bounties would be uh, destroyed. We know that that feeling is, is strong, but the the feeling of hasad, and especially the most dangerous hasad that is acted upon, is usually with respect to those people who are closest to you. In fact, a study was done by uh, Robert Frank. Called, uh, study was called the luxury fever, and he found that most people would agree or would be happy to make less total money as long as they made more money than their neighbors. <laughs> okay, so again, those people who are closest to them, those people they can compare themselves with. They will be willing to make less total money as, just as long as the lesser amount of money is still more than what the neighbors make. So in other words, for example, they would prefer to make $85,000 a year. If their neighbors are all making 75000 they would be happier making $85,000 a year than making $100,000 a year if their neighbors are making $125,000 a year. So, <laughs> this shows you the, the, this feeling of, of competitiveness which many times is close to al-hasad. You just want to make sure that you are better off than those people around you. So when those people around you are start, are getting better off, then then this is when you start feeling resentment in your, in your heart. And you don't want those people around you to be better off than you. Even though they're your friends, maybe they're even your, your brothers and your sisters and your relatives, uh, you don't want them to feel to be better off than you. And if they are, then this feeling of al-hasad comes to you. And oftentimes what this results in is that is the, if then some harm comes to them, you do start feeling some kind of pleasure. In fact, one philosopher, he said that in the misfortune of our best friends, we always find something that is not displeasing to us. In the misfortune of our best friends, we always find something that is not displeasing to us. This is a real disease. Okay? This is a real disease in the heart. Well, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I, and I hope that this kind of disease does not afflict our Muslims and our, and our uh, brothers and sisters in Islam. That you get to that point where even those people who are your best friends, who you should be closest to and have the most sincere kind of love and feelings for, that when misfortune comes to them, you actually feel something good, some kind of pleasure, that now you are ahead of those people who are closest to you and those people who you feel that you're competing with. Another important extremely important lesson that we can get from these incidents of al-hasad that we see in, in, the, in the Quran is that al-hasad can actually keep someone from following the truth al-hasad can keep someone from following what is right and what is the path that he's supposed to follow we find this in the case of a shaitan as I said before a shaitan knows who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and knows that this command has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him directly what prevented you from prostrating when I ordered you to do so? 
So this feeling of hasad is enough to keep someone from, follow, from following the truth. If a person is not willing to follow the truth, I mean if a, if a human being has given up that desire to follow what is true, then really what value is, to, is there to a human being? Those people who are sent to the hellfire, those people whom we can say are valueless, these are the people who have rejected and refused to follow the truth. And this can be uh, the result of al hasad We don't have the time to, to bring all of the verse in the Qur'an and discuss this uh, in detail, but if we look at the Qur'an and, and the situation of Bani Israel, and we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed them over and over again. And we know that when the, when the Prophet وسلم, before the Prophet وسلم, had had come, we know that among the Arabs, those Jews who were living among the Arabs, they used to tell the Arabs that there is a prophet who is going to come, and when he comes we will be successful over you and so forth. But when the Prophet Muhammad came, and when they even recognized the truth of the Prophet Muhammad what was their reaction? Did they accept the Prophet Muhammad Did they follow the Prophet Did they support the Prophet or because this Prophet had come to someone other than their own people, other than from Bani Israel, other than from among the Jews, because this was not someone who came from among them, but actually came from the other, what they call nowadays the other, came from the Arabs, out of that hasad, out of that envy that it came to someone else and not to them, they refused to follow the truth, even though they could recognize the truth, even though they could recognize that the Prophet was the Prophet who was promised to come and whom they were expecting this disease of Al-Hasid could be great enough that it will keep them from accepting the truth. You know, if you think a little bit more about the, the Muslims, the early Muslims, the first Muslims who accepted uh, Islam, they went from a state of Jahiliyyah a state of ignorance to the state of, of Islam, to submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of tawheed, of believing only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and submitting only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before they were worshipping idols, they were involved in all sorts of nonsense before Islam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them to Islam and guided them to tawheed. And you would think, you would think for example that the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book, would recognize what happened to these people? That this is a, this is a great thing. Even if even if someone is just an unbiased observer, but he himself believes in monotheism, and he sees these people going from worshiping all these idols to saying, "No, there's only one God." And in addition to that, they are saying this is the same God who sent Moses, who sent Isa alayhi salam, and sent all the earlier prophets. You would think. You would think that they would at least be happy and proud of this fact that look, at least these people have left polytheism, they have left uh, worshipping these idols and so forth. But that is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes many of the people of the book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead says, What the kathirum min ahli kitabi law yuruddunakum min ba'di imanikum kufaran hasadan min indi anfusihim min ba'di ma tabayyana lahum al haq. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even after the truth had been made clear to them, in other words, they know the truth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi they know the truth of this tawheed that is obviously being taught now and the, that the Muslims are following, even though many of the, of the people of the book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, many of the people of the book wish that they could turn away as disbelievers after you have believed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these people who have gone from jahiliyyah from worshipping all these idols, instead of being accepted and applauded and approved by these people who also believe in, in monotheism, they claim, instead of seeing what a great step they have taken, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that many of them wish that you would go back to kufr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the reason why they're feeling that, hasadan min indi anfusim, out of envy from their own selves. That now you have gotten the truth the truth is no longer with them. They now actually have to follow what you're following and submit and accept what you're following. And this was too much for them.
this was too much for them the feeling of envy in their hearts this disease in their hearts was so great that this was too much for them they could not follow the truth they would not accept the truth even though it is clear to them that this is the truth but out of envy they would not accept and follow the truth this very clear point again should be enough for every individual to realize the danger of al hasid that al hasid is such that it can make someone reject and refuse to follow the truth even though the truth is clear to them if the truth comes from someone that they don't like if it comes from in a way to them that they, they don't like or that someone else has this bounty instead of, of themselves and so therefore now they have to recognize that these people have this bounty and they have to follow this uh, bounty of Islam that these other people have that could be sometimes too much in the heart of uh, individuals and so therefore they would prefer imagine this they would prefer to reject the truth and not follow the truth simply out of this envy in their hearts this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly saying in this verse in the Quran وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ كِتَابِ لَوْ يَرَدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِمَانِكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِمَانِكُمْ كُفَارًا حَسَدًا مِنْ عَنِّي أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ Many of the people of the book wish that they could turn you away as disbelievers after you've believed out of envy from their own selves even after the truth has been made clear to them Surah Al-Baqarah verse 109 Just reflect upon this, think about this fact and inshallah uh, if you do reflect uh, upon it and keep this point in mind inshallah that will keep you from allowing and hasad any time it enters in your heart to grow and to develop because it could be the most dangerous as we started at the beginning there are some diseases that are most dangerous for human beings it could be the most dangerous thing that ever enters in your heart and could cause you as we said, to reject the truth, not to follow the truth, and lead you into the hellfire forever. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the, the brother, the, the son of Adam, فَأَسْبَحَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِ And he became one of the losers. It could lead you to become one of the losers without any question. These are actually what we pointed out so far. These are actually just some of the, <laughs> some of the evils of Hasan. There are numerous evils of al-hasad that, that many of the ulama have pointed out. For example, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah notes that al-hasad rarely occurs without the uh, associated feeling of ill will and, and, and hatred and malice. And in fact, when we gave the definitions earlier, the German definition pointed this out uh, explicitly, the feeling of malice and ill will so when, when a hasad develops in the heart, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, almost always it's going to be associated or accompanied, I should say, with this feeling of hatred also. And when we spoke about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which the Prophet ﷺ was giving us general guidance for how we as a Muslim ummah should behave towards one another, and the hadith began, لا تحسد do not be envious of one another. Another thing that Muslims should never do also is to hate one another. So in the same uh, in the same hadith, so just a few phrases after saying do not be envious of one another, the Prophet ﷺ said, Wala tabaghadu, do not hate one another. Do not hate one another. So al Hasid, one of the aspects of al Hasid, and this is also pointed out by many authors, one of the aspects of al Hasid is that it leads to other sins. So al hasad in itself is a sin, but it can also lead to many other sins. One of them is hatred of your brother Muslim. Other, for example, it can also lead to greed and other things. So al hasad in itself is evil, and it can also lead to many other destructive evils in the heart as well. Not just actual act that you do based on al hasad, but also other diseases of the heart can be the result of allowing al hasad to to be in your heart. So. Obviously, since al hasad could lead to other diseases such as hatred of others and, and, and uh, greed and so forth, th therefore, obviously, from a societal point of view, al hasad can be something very destructive. It strikes at the very core 
of the feelings of love and compassion that believers should have towards one another. Because uh, there are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons for this, as some of the authors pointed out, is that one of the things about al is that the, the person is happy just to make other people unhappy. Even to make himself worse off. He doesn't even care if he makes himself worse off. He may even, he may even sacrifice uh, wealth to, in order to bring harm to others. To bring harm to the bounties that other people have received. So it has a general uh, societal level of harm that it brings to the Muslim community as a whole. And again, we emphasized that point before when we talked about the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith in which he's talking about the social relations of the believers. He began by saying, لا تحسدوا. Another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, دَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ دَاءُ الْأُمَّمِ مِنْ قَبْلَكُمُ الْحَسَدُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ هِيَ الْحَالِقَةُ لَا أَقُولُ تَحْلِقُ شَعْرُ وَلَكِنْ تَحْلِقُ الدِّينِ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمن ولا تؤمن حتى تحب. The Prophet ﷺ said that coming upon you is the disease of the peoples before you. Envy and hatred. Al Hasad wal Baghda. And as we said, Al Hasad can lead to and is usually accompanied by hatred. So here the Prophet ﷺ is giving us perhaps the original disease and then the resultant disease that also comes about due to that original disease. So coming upon you is the disease of the peoples before you, envy and hatred. And the hatred is the thing that shaves. I do not say that it shaves hair, but it shaves the religion. By the one in whose hand is my soul, you will not enter paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love one another. So at the end of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that we will not enter Jannah until we believe. If you contrast that with what's the, at the beginning of the hadith, so at the end of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that we will not enter Jannah until we believe. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying that we will not really believe until we love one another. So now if you contrast with that, you contrast that with what the Prophet ﷺ said at the beginning of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is talking about the hasad and the Dagda. He's basically he's telling us that if these diseases are in our heart of envy and hatred, then we're not going to have that proper love that we're supposed to have for one another. And so, so therefore these two diseases can keep us from entering into Jannah. This is the implication of what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us. And he's telling us that this disease of al-Hasad and its corresponding disease of, of, of Baghda or hatred, this is something that that cuts the deen, cuts the religion itself. So here the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that this disease is going to come upon this nation. But by ilaykum, it is coming to us, it is like crawling, creeping towards us. This disease that afflicted the people before us. So nowadays, for example, everyone is talking about the uh, bird flu virus and everyone is so concerned that this disease is coming and, and uh, we have to take all the precautions and so many animals are being slaughtered because of it. Well, here the Prophet ﷺ is warning us of a disease, a much more dangerous disease, obviously, for our spiritual health. How do we respond to these words of the Prophet ﷺ? He's telling us that this disease is coming to this nation. And how do we respond? Are we taking the same kind of steps and precaution, being as careful and being as aware to make sure that this disease, inshallah, is not going to affect our hearts? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are now out of time, so we're going to have to stop at this, at this point. What we are doing right now, obviously, is we are discussing some of the evils of al-Hasid and some of the things that al-Hasid results in. And the goal of this, inshallah, is, is that uh, everyone will recognize that al-Hasid is something that they want to stay uh, as far away from as possible. They will not allow it to enter in their hearts. They will not be complacent and lackadaisical, if it does ever, ever enter in our hearts, they will re re recognize it for the evil disease that it is, and inshallah, uh, they will work their best to remove it uh, from their hearts. So inshallah, next time we will continue with some of the, the, the some of the evil effects of al-hasad, and then speak about what should we do if we are feeling these effects, or feeling al-hasad in our heart, what are some of the things that we can do, inshallah. Actually, we, we agreed upon 
we agreed that this lecture series will be maybe no more than six or seven. Uh, so therefore, some of the points, uh, like the causes of hazard, we might have to go through quickly or, or skip them. But inshallah, they're all in my book, uh, The Evils of al Hasid, which inshallah, <laughs> someday inshallah will be made uh, available. And uh, all the details and the further details inshallah are in that book that these lectures are based on. And also all the references and everything which uh, which you could which you will need inshallah. But now we'll have to end uh, on that point. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم